Good morning, Due West. My name is Butch Gaudet, and I serve on the admin board here at the church. As we prepare for worship this morning, here are a few things to remember. Due West adults, you can make a difference in the lives of our youth. Please use the QR code on the screen or in this week's Insight to sign up to help serve and clean up for youth dinners on Sunday nights. Due West is pleased to be hosting a special two-part seminar called Why the Jews? Understanding the Long and Tragic History of Anti-Semitism, presented by Mr. Brendan Murphy. This event will be held in the Sanctuary of Building A beginning next Sunday, August 4th, from 4 to 6 p.m., and will conclude Monday, August 5th, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. It's free of charge, and everyone is invited. Also on the 4th, join us at the Ignite for our Back to School Bash. We'll have a color war, slip and slide, obstacle course, and Kona Ice. We're closed to get dirty in and bring a white shirt for the color war. No sign up is needed, just bring your friends and join in the fun. And a quick reminder about what was mentioned last week. Due to a scheduling conflict, we're changing the pickleball start date. The new date is Monday, August 5th. We'll play every Monday and Wednesday during August at 7 p.m. in the Family Life Center. Mondays will be for beginners and Wednesday will be for more advanced players. We will need a few advanced players to come on Mondays to offer assistance and coaching. Finally, we will have a healing service, August 25th in Building A at 5.30 p.m. If you or anyone you know are in need of comfort or healing, please bring them with you for worship. Now prepare your hearts for worship. Good morning, Due West. How are y'all doing? Good. Are you ready to worship the Lord this morning? How many of y'all believe that Jesus Christ has overcome? Amen. Yes, I love that. You're all just raising your hands. You can shout amen. How many of you believe Jesus Christ has overcome? Amen. Love it. That means that you have won the victory. Amen? amen. Well, let's sing about it. I'll ask you to stand as you are able and let us join together singing victory in Jesus.
remain standing as we recite together this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay, please be seated. Uh, if you have any connection at all to the school system, you know that school teachers in Cobb County went back on Thursday, but students go back this week. Uh, so we are praying for all of our teachers, all of our students, and we're doing this morning a blessing of the backpacks. So you can see some folks have already brought their backpacks up here. You can also see, I don't know whose this is that I'm picking up, uh, but this, the tag on it, it's got due west on here, and it, an apple says the Lord bless you and keep you uh, from numbers, something that as a church we just wanted to give folks to have to remind our students that we as a church family are praying for them. And we as a church family are praying for them, amen? amen. All right, so let me ask now, uh, if you're a student going back to school this week, would you stand up? If you're all excited, there you go. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hmm, Ma'am, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I wanted, I was doing students first. Uh, now, if you're a teacher or work at a school, would you also stand? Yeah, thank you so much for what you do. Uh, so if you're out there, so just keep standing. If you will, as a congregation, kind of lift your hands towards these folks, just as we pray for them, let's pray. Holy and gracious God, these backpacks represent the beginning of a new year, a new school year. Father, we give that year to you here and now for the students that are present and those that are not with us today, for the teachers, the staff that are with us, and those that aren't able to be here today or that were at other services. Father, we lift them before you. We pray that this will be the best year yet. We pray that you will be moving in their lives and through their lives in powerful ways this year. We pray your blessings on all that's taught and all that's learned. Father, we thank you. We thank you that from this congregation, we have a group of students and adults that will go into these schools and represent Jesus. Lord, be your hands and feet in all that they do. So we pray today your blessings on them as they go back to school this week and for the entire year. We give you thanks and praise for them in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. I thank you so much. You want to come and get your backpack? And if children want to go down to children's ministry, that's cool. If you, you can drop those off with your parents. Go ahead and get them used to hanging on to your stuff. Also, Sam, if you want to come up, we're excited this morning. We have a baptism this morning, so let me ask you guys as a family if you'll come up. Yeah, so far, can Say, we come see me yet? Come here. This is Owen. Look at Miss Katie back there. Okay. Cool. Dearly beloved. Baptism is outward and invisible sign of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. How he said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So I will remind you that as we gather for baptism, we believe that this is a celebration of God's grace, which is at work in all of our lives. 
from the very youngest to the very oldest. So we baptize as Methodists, we baptize children, babies, uh, to celebrate what God is doing in their lives. So I'm going to ask Sam to pour out the water and pray over the water. All right. Would you join me in prayer over this water? Kind Father, we ask that you would infuse this water with your spirit so that it would be an outward sign of an inward grace, marking this child as one of your chosen people. Um, Lord, a cleansing and a beautiful anointing. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Guys, do you in presenting this child for baptism confess your faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? You do? Do you accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before him a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care that he be brought up in the Christian faith and that he be taught the holy scriptures? And that he learns to give reverent attendance on the private and public worship of God. All right. Will you endeavor to keep him under the ministry and guidance of the church until he, by the power of God, shall accept for himself the gift of salvation? All right. And be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church. All right. What name is given this child? John Owen. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. Amen. And let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for Owen. We thank you, dear God, for his parents and his family bringing him here before you today. We pray your blessings on their home. And Lord, we pray your blessings on Owen. We pray that as he is nurtured and surrounded by love, Lord, that you will, you will help nurture his faith. And Lord, we pray for him for that faith that for that day that he will come back to this place, to this altar, and claim his faith and his trust in Jesus as his Savior and his Lord. And Lord, we will again on that day celebrate. But we thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care, John Owen, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that he may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ? Would you respond? After the example of Christ, that this child, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Okay, come on, let's take a quick little walk. Let these folks see ya. This is your church family. We all just made a promise to help nurture his faith and guide his faith. He is part of our family. Right? Part of our family. Anything you would do for your child, remember Owen is one of our children. So anything, we will do that for him as well. Okay. Hang on, go back. See, look at Matt. Look at Matt. There you go. <laughs> First time I met him, he was t- about 12 hours old. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, in the hospital. Yeah, it was cool. All right. Okay, you ready to go back? See, I, you know, I could do this all day, right? Okay, God bless y'all. Thank y'all so much. All right. Oh. Uh, what a great day of celebrations this morning. Uh, And we do come to a time in our worship when we share both celebrations, our joys, as well as the concerns in the life of our church, Uh, our blessings this morning of our students, our teachers, the backpacks, that's certainly a joy. Baptisms are always a joy. Uh, If you were here over the weekend, you got to see Center for the Arts had another show. We'll see some pictures in a little bit of some of their recent shows. Uh, But they did a great job, and it's always a joy to celebrate what they are doing. God is doing a lot in the life of our church, and we celebrate all of it. Uh, this morning, Sam's going to wrap up his series on uh, being overcomers. I know if you've been here through the month of July, you've got a chance to hear him preach, and I'm so grateful for him and for the words that God has given him over the course of uh, this month and for what a blessing he has been. Uh, 
We also want to remember some concerns in the life of our church. Uh, the family of Christy Hill, who passed away. We want to remember her family. Uh, Jane Swanson, who's sitting down in the front row, who's uh, helped us with all of the blessings of the backpacks. Uh, Jane lost her mama. Uh, was that last Sunday? A week ago today. Uh, so please keep Jane and her family in your prayers during this time. Uh, also, you're going to hear uh, Amy and Katie Helen singing a little bit. Uh, Amy sang in a group uh, called the Neelands for a, a good while, a while back. And if you've seen on the news, there was a plane crash, and three members of that gospel group lost their lives uh, over the weekend. So we certainly want to remember the gospel music community, <clears throat> the Neeland family, uh, all those associated. Just a tragedy, just a tragedy, and we want to keep them all in our prayers. I know that you all have concerns on your hearts that you want to take to the Lord in prayer, and we like to give you the opportunity to do that. So I'll have a moment of silent prayers when you can quietly lift your prayers before the throne of God, and then I'll offer a prayer for the church. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy and gracious God, as we come into your house this morning and we gather in your name, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you're doing in the life of our church. Father, for all the joys that we celebrate, for all the blessings we have received from you, Lord, we are just in awe. You are a God who can do all things. You are a God, Lord, who provides for us. You are a God who watches over and protects us. You are a God who brings us healing. You are a God, Lord, who is in all that we do. Because you are a holy God, we come and we lift our praises before you. Lord, with the psalmist, we say, praise the Lord, let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. Father, we come to praise you. We come in worship. We come, dear Lord, with gratitude. We come with thanks for all you have done. Father, we thank you for the work that you have done in this congregation, through this congregation. Father, we thank you that you move in ways that are unfathomable to us, but we see the evidence. We see the evidence. Father, we pray as school gets ready to start back. We pray for all of our students, for all of our teachers. Father, we pray that you will be present with them as we continue praying for them. Father, we pray not only that you would bless their year, but you would use them, Lord, as instruments of ministry in their schools. Lord, we ask that you would continue to be with us this morning. We pray for Sam, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on him and anoint him, Father, anoint him to bring your words to us. Father, for those that are hurting this morning, those who are grieving, those who are dealing with a future that is uncertain, we pray for them. Father, sometimes it's hard to see your presence, but in faith we know you are there. So, Lord, we pray that you would give assurance to those that are struggling this week. Uh, give them faith to cover their doubts, to know that you are God, and you will see them through. Father, as we continue to worship you, we pray that you will draw each of us each of us, closer to you. For we pray, dear Lord, in the name of our Lord, in the name of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let me at this time invite our ushers to come down as we prepare to receive our offering. I mentioned Center for the Arts. We have some pictures from the shows. You see some familiar faces up there. Uh, also, let me just say a special word. If you're visiting with us for the first time, make sure you stop at the Visitor Center. Uh, and meet the rhymers. There's a great way to see what's going on in the life of the church and get connected. But as you can see these pictures, 
It's a great way. Uh, just it's, as always, we like to share stories of the things that we do as a church and to say thank you because it's your generosity, your faithfulness that allows us to have ministries like this. So as always, thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are grateful for the faithfulness of your people. And Lord, as we once again bring our tithes and our offerings before you, we pray that you would receive them today, dear Lord, and use them for kingdom work. In Jesus' name, amen. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear side would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
Please be seated. Good morning, and uh, first and foremost, wonderful job. Uh, we just thank you so much for that offering of, of praise and worship, and that includes you guys too. Um, so thank you uh, for leading us, and David, thank you for being willing to uh, let me occupy the pulpit uh, this month of July. It's, it's been a pleasure, um, and I am eagerly waiting. Is it Family Feud? Family Feud. Family feud. Um, so um, August is going to be a lot of fun, so I hope to see you all there for that. Now, we have, we have entered into another uh, Olympic season, and I don't, I don't know if you watch the Olympics like I do, but I, I've been known to get sucked in to whatever random thing is on, and suddenly it is like fencing is the most important thing to me uh, in the world. Um, it's like, wow, the fate of society rests in the balance. But, uh, you know, the things that I really go for, especially in the Summer Olympic, are the races, um, particularly the relay races. And it's, you know, it, I, I have not been a serious runner for some time, but there's just something about it that I love it. I love to see um, the culmination of a relay um, happen. And the last leg of the race is arguably the most exciting. Now, uh, maybe you're familiar. Does anyone know what the final leg of a relay is typically called? You can call it out. Yes, the anchor leg. The anchor leg. The anchor is the most exciting. And if you're on a relay race, right, you know that that is probably your best or one of your best runners. And the thing that you want is for the anchor to hold, right? If you are in the lead, you want them to bring home the medal, right? A good anchor knows how to finish strong. A good anchor knows how to leave it all on the track. And I tell you what, uh, back in the day, I got, I got a chance to be the anchor leg, and it was so fun. It was so exciting. You know, there's nothing like watching an anchor leg come from behind um, and take the lead. Oh, man, gets me going just talking about it. Anyways, that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about what it means not just to be an overcomer, but to finish strong, to finish strong, to live all of our life and to keep our faith all the way to the very end. You know, this July, we have been taking some time and recognizing that life is full of hard things. And the odds are each and every one of us is going through something that's hard. And if we're not, we probably just came out of it or we're about to head into a hard thing. Life is full of hard things. And we've been using this quote from Catherine Wolf, um, where she says, God made you to do the hard thing in the good story that he's writing for your life. If you take nothing but this from the July Sermon Series, uh, I, I think it will be a win. Because this, there's so much truth packed into this quote. And so we've been looking at it week in and week out. It's another way of saying God made each and every one of us to be overcomers, not to be defined by the hard things in our lives, but instead by the way in which, by faith in, in Jesus Christ, we overcome. So we started this series by, by looking right at Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we looked at his example as, as the one who's overcome sin and death and the grave, the trailblazer, as it were. Um, who allows us to overcome because he has overcome. Then we, we looked at our identity. We studied Psalm 139 and how God has good plans and purposes for our lives and how he has created us to be overcomers as well. Last week, we discussed the role of community and friendship. What an important word it is that community is really not just a relationship with the Lord, but the friendships that he puts around us and that we help establish around us that are so vital in doing the hard thing in the good story. 
that God's writing in our lives. And today we want to talk about finishing well, all the way to the end. And so we're going to look at Paul's writing in 2 Timothy. But before we do, I want to spend a little bit of time to set the stage because context is important. And here, here is the context. Our scripture, or the year is, eight, is A.D. 64. Nero is the emperor of Rome, and the persecution of Christians under his reign is brutal and intense. Scholars report that Christians are set ablaze in Nero's gardens at night to light the gardens. Uh, it's hard to imagine the intensity of that persecution. Paul, the author of the letter, is writing from Rome. He's in prison, probably for the second time, and under trial. It doesn't look good. This will be his last letter. He's writing to Timothy, his younger protege. And as if outward pressures of the culture against the church weren't enough, tensions from inside the early church are mounting. False teachings, discord, division, the fate of the church still in its infancy sits in the balance. And so we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. You can follow along on the screens, your pew Bibles, or any other way that you can get this passage. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in, the, in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not listen and put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You know, there's two main points that Paul is presenting here. The first is his charge to Timothy, and the second is his personal testimony. I think we can benefit from both, so I want to spend some time looking at each section. So let's first examine Paul's charge to Timothy. This starts really at the end of verse 1 into verse 2, and he says, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct. Rebuke. And encourage with great patience and careful instructions. You know, in some ways, this gives us some helpful commentary on what is most needed in this community. They need God's word preached. They need God's word presented in a way that corrects, rebukes, and encourages. And they need deeply patient and careful instruction. So do we. <laughs> so do we. You know, you might not have the call to preach in the pulpit, but you do, as we all do, have the call and the charge to live out your faith in Jesus. This challenge is to teachers and pastors and parents as well. And I think it, it begs this question. Do you have a teachable spirit? Do you have a teachable spirit? Are you open to correction and rebuke? Some of you know that I, I spent some time serving overseas as a missionary, and one of the things that they did to equip our company of 40 people um, was this practice of regular feedback. Now, we, we traveled as a pack in 40, but then when we got into country, we broke into teams of five or seven, and what uh, the stateside leadership told us, they said, Listen, we have realized that unless we put some of these edifying practices of community in place, things will very quickly unravel. Um, 
And so one of, the, one of the things that we were trained and that we practiced was regular feedback. Day in and day out, sitting with one another, the people that we were serving alongside and saying, encouraging one another, this is where I have seen the Lord at work in you. And also correction and rebuke. These are the ways that I see, God, these are your blind spots. These are, this is good feedback. And I will tell you, that is hard. <laughs> that is scary to subject yourself to that. And the truth is, you know, after four or five months, we switched to every other day. Um, but this is what I can tell you after 11 months of that. There is nothing that builds community like that. There is nothing. Surrounding yourself with people who love you enough to say something hard and good to you, oh man, we watched people's lives be absolutely transformed by encouragement, correction, and rebuke. The kind of rebuke that says, I love you enough to say, hey, this is hard. Um, I, I, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving. I will be with you uh, with God's grace to help you pick up the pieces and walk in, in new life and walk in transformed living. Oh, man, it's powerful. Once you experience that community and that kind of transformation that can happen in those spaces, boy, is it hard to come back to a status quo where people avoid the problems that they have with one another where people, instead of addressing an issue with someone, they talk to someone else and triangulate a problem. Ah, oh, that's not correction. That's not rebuke. That's not encouragement. These things are so important, so helpful. They transform our lives in the best of ways. And I think what we find in their absence is what Paul predicts in verses 3 and 4. He says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Boy, does that sound familiar. It's like, Paul, are you reading, are you reading our newspaper? Are you, are you watching some of the, the news feeds that I see? This is a real and pressing issue in our culture. We're finding social media platforms and algorithms that serve up all of what we want to hear and none of what we don't want to hear. We find, I think, in many ways that that creates an, a, an increasingly polarizing environment. Right? This is... This is this is disturbing, but, but the difference here is not just what are my political preferences, right? This is, this is a difference between myths and sound doctrine, right? And I think that this is the great thing that we can be lured away from, right? About what is important and what is essential to the faith and be lured into talking about things that simply do not matter, that are not just secondary but, but tertiary and beyond. I'm like, what are we wasting our time with this? Is this even true? Is this a myth? Paul is calling us back to take hold of that which is important, of sound doctrine, instead of what our itching ears want to hear, of what is, is alluring for the time. You know, and I, I think about this question as I, as I considered this passage. When was the last time you or someone you know responded well to correction and rebuke? When was the last time you know someone or yourself responded well to correction and rebuke? Or even received it in the first place? Who's offering correction and rebuke these days? Hmm. Makes you wonder. Food for thought. So it continues on in verse 5. He says, But keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And you know, there's, we could parse out each and every phrase here, but the one that stands out to me is that endure hardship. I think that's Paul talking to Timothy and saying, Be an overcomer. Be an overcomer. And I think the context here is so important. You know, this could be any type of general hardship that, that, 
that everyone encounters at various times and points in their lives. But I think more likely what Paul's talking about is the type of hardship and adversity that comes because of your faith, because of the way you live out your faith. Pressures from the greater society, that type of hardship. Or because of your willingness to uphold sound doctrine. Or your willingness to correct and rebuke. Just look at Paul. Look where, look where him living out his faith has got him. Hmm. Make no mistake. You will encounter hardship because of your faith. And if you're experiencing hardship, there's some encouragement for you. If you're experiencing hardship because of your faith, in many ways, that is a signal that you're living your faith out in such a way that you're dangerous to the enemy. Wow, praise God. I hope that we can live lives that are dangerous to the enemy, that, that, that encounter some hardship. And the truth is, God made us for that kind of hardship and walks with us through it. So that's, that's Paul's charge to Timothy. I think that's good. I think there's a lot we can glean from. I want to focus now on the second part, Paul's own testimony. This is where he says this in verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Excuse me. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Here's the thing. Death is a reality. Death is a reality. You will die. I will die. The people that you know will, and love will die. Your children will die. Their children will die. Unless the Lord comes back... The two realities that we are faced with are taxes and what? Death, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's funny to me how, in a way, it still catches us by surprise. And I'm convinced that the lie the world wants to tell us is that we should avoid death at all costs. We should not talk about deaths. We should avoid anything that points to deaths. We, we shouldn't go to nursing homes. We should avoid going to funerals. Avoid death. Avoid death. But you know what? The reality is when we don't talk about death and we avoid death, we lose the perspective that only death can bring because there's nothing like death or nothing like nearing the end of your life that allows you to see with sobriety and clarity whether or not the things that you've engaged with are important or not, right? I've got this story. I got to know my grandfather pretty well towards the end of his life. He was a lifelong dairy farmer in Shreve, Ohio, God's country as he called it. Um, and he said to me on one occasion, um, he was in his early 90s, and he said, Sam, the time and the investment that I have made in cows will never further my legacy. They'll never, they'll, no cow is ever going to pass on any of the investment that I've, that I've given to them. He said, I really wish I would have spent more time investing in people. Sam, I wish I would have spent more time loving my neighbor. There's nothing like the end of his life that allowed him to look back the reality of death with clarity. We need that. Don't believe the lie that we can't talk about death, that we need to avoid it. It will allow you to look at your life and what you're doing with clarity. Is this, imp is this important? Is this what God would have me to do? All right? It's important. We need it. We need that perspective. You know, this is where I really want to lean in because I believe that this is not just a testimony that Paul is sharing of the super Christians, but the testimony of every believer. I believe that God desires to do a work in every single one of us so that at the end of our lives, we'll be able to say, alongside Paul, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. In other words, I've left it all on the course. Friends, this is what an overcomer sounds like. This is what it looks like to finish strong. You know, I've been walking with the Lord long enough now that, that I can, not, not as long as some of you, but long enough now that I can look back a decade or two 
and I can see the progression of some of those around me. I can look back at, at people who 10, 15, 20 years ago were as passionate and as on fire for the Lord as anyone that I knew. And some of those people I have seen walk away from the Lord. It's as if they fought a portion of the fight. They ran a part of the race. You know, there's other people that I look back on and a decade or so ago, they were about as far from the Lord as you could be and have since turned and are now walking and following Jesus in the most beautiful and redemptive way. Those people have entered the fight. They have begun the race, right? But the, and, and I've seen people at all stages and in between those two points. And I think the question for all of us that we need to ask is who will finish well? Who will keep the faith? The overcomer is the one who keeps the faith. The overcomer is the one who finishes strong. I want to tell you a story. Um, actually, I'll, I'll save the story. I want to tell you this first. Historically speaking, this is a huge point. Um, if you get a chance to befriend a hospice nurse or you know one, I think you will find that they will give you more than a couple testimonies of how Christians die differently. In fact, in the Methodist movement, this was a huge point for early Methodists. There are so many accounts recorded of early Methodists inviting people to their deathbed to say, if you want to know what I believe, if you want to see what I believe lived out all the way to the very end, you come to my deathbed. You watch me be received into the kingdom. Powerful, powerful testimonies of Christians finishing strong. It's wonderful. My dad tells a story of a woman in his congregation by the name of Imogene Brown. Imogene Brown was, dad says, about all of five feet, maybe that. She lived uh, well into her 90s, and she was in good health for so much of her life. She was a good and godly woman. And there was one occasion where uh, the, the, the village of Lakemore lost power, which would be on a Sunday morning, which would be a great excuse not to go to church, especially if you were Imogene. But Imogene found a ladder, hooked it up in her garage, set it up, pulled the emergency release lever of the garage door, then bent down, lifted that garage door up, and made it to church. I tell you what, she was committed. And there was a, a day where... She started, she started to feel bad, and they eventually took her to the hospital, and they, after a series of tests, the doctors came in, and they told her, they said, Imogene, your, your kidneys have shut down. There's really no treatment that we can offer you. You have days to live. Now, my dad was able to be with her, and they were able to meet in that hospital room and talk about uh, the life that is to come. Living, living with Jesus and walking into a heavenly reward. And dad was able to pray with her. And he, he came back the next day and he said, you never really know what to expect with people in that, in that place. And so he, he, he talked with her a little bit more. And she said, you know what, Pastor Jeff? I've been thinking a lot about our conversation yesterday. And she said, you know what? She said, I'm getting pretty excited getting really excited. I'm really looking forward to being with Jesus. I'm getting so excited. 24 hours later, dad went back to visit Imogene and she was no longer responding. 48 hours later and she had been welcomed in to the kingdom with open arms. I'm getting pretty excited. I'm getting pretty excited. You know, dad said most people get to the end of their lives and they're shocked. But Imogene had been living her life towards Jesus so that when the moment came and when her health immediately flipped from good to bad, she was ready to be excited about the life that was to come. Hmm. Paul says in verse 8, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but all also to all who have longed for his appearing. You know, what type of crown is this? This is kind of the Olympic crown. It's the, the wreath given to victors of Greek races. You know, I love how Paul says, 
but not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. This isn't just Paul's reward for finishing strong. This is the reward and the promise for each and every one of us if we'll take hold of it by faith. You know, this is, this is speculative, and this is something that my dad says, so I should give him credit, but I, I, I'm inclined to believe it as well. You know, I think that uh, this picture of crowns is good. This picture of receiving a reward for earthly inheritance is a beautiful thing. But this is, this is what I think. Um, don't write it down as gospel, but if it encourages you, great. Um, I think that whatever reward we get for earthly faithfulness, when we stand in the Lord's presence, whatever crown that is, will be that which we have to cast at the Lord's feet in praise. That will be the offering of praise of our lives. The well done, good and faithful servant will be that, the substance of which we have to give back to the Lord and say, God, you were worthy of all of my life all along. What a shame it would be to stand in the Lord's presence and have nothing to give. To say, God, you were faithful and I was not. I was not. But I think what God longs to do in each and every one of our lives is to bear the fruit of righteousness, to, to, to race with us in such a way that we, we win the crown, that we, we bear good and lasting fruit. We love to see a strong finish. And that's what's on the table for each of us today. In other words, God made you to do the hard thing in the good story he's writing for your life, for all of your life. And the truth is, we know how the story ends. I want to invite you to let the reality of Christ's promises and his victory sink into your heart and life. And I want to offer a word of, of caution as well as an invitation. And then I'll close. I promise I'll be done soon. Here's my word of caution. Be wary. Be cautious of the comfortable. Be cautious of getting comfortable. There are so many hard things that the Lord would have us to do and has created us to do. And comfort is the thing that will keep us from those things. Oh, I, 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 you know, it's, but it's, it's more comfortable not to say the hard thing. It's more comfortable not to, not to go out of my way. I don't, I just, you know, I would prefer to be comfortable. Don't, don't get comfortable when God's calling you to more. Don't get comfortable when God made you for more. I caution you about comfort. And then this invitation I was, I was looking at, it, uh, at, a, at a reading this, this week, and it was pointing out that when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, before he gets to give us this day our daily bread, lead us not into temptation, you know, forgive us our trespasses, those kind of things, those inward elements of faith and spirituality, which are so important, he starts the prayer with a focus not inwardly on ourselves, but outwardly on the Lord. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. See, the answer and the focus and the invitation for all of us is to first and foremost set our gaze on Christ. Set our focus on the one who is holy, on the one who is able. And I think in that we find that there is the daily provision of bread. There is the forgiveness of sins, that all of our needs and wants are met in Christ Jesus. But he invites us as we run this race, as we fight this fight, to do it with him and to keep our focus on him. So I want to invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you that you have made us to be overcomers, that you are an overcomer yourself. You pave the way, that you run this race of life with us, that you fight this, this, this good fight with us and strengthen us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would take hold of that promise. God, that you have made us 
to do the hard thing day in and day out, strengthening us to do the hard thing and the good story that you're writing for our lives so that we can know, be known at the end as overcomers. Not because of our goodness, but Lord, because of who you are and who you have been in us. Lord, I pray that you would fashion this community in that way, by your grace and by your mercy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I invite you as you're able to stand as we respond to the word and let us sing together in Christ alone.
right, so I've got two opportunities to, to bring to your attention following the service, the first of which is communion in the gathering room. If you would like to go and strengthen your faith in that way, you are invited. And Jane, where are we going if we want to go pray? Stay right here, and this will be the hub of where we go from this place to go and pray for our schools um, in this community. So I invite you uh, to do that as well. What a wonderful way of fighting the good fight and running the, the, the good race. Would you receive this blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord uh, make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. And may the Lord strengthen you today and every moment and day from this day forward to do the hard thing in the good story that he's writing for your life. In the name of the Father and the Spirit and the Son, I pray. Amen. Go in peace.